Combat can be a lot of fun in Hogwarts Legacy, but it can also be pretty frustrating if you don't know some important tips and master a few essential mechanics. So we're going to break down all the essentials of magical combat, including some tips I haven't seen anyone else cover. Whether you're playing on PC or console, with mouse and keyboard or controller, I've got you covered. So wands at the ready, and let's go. The first and one of the most important combat mechanics you need to master is using Protego to block and parry attacks. The game teaches you very early that enemy attacks are telegraphed with either orange or red halos that appear around your character's head. If the halo is orange, you can block it using Protego by hitting triangle on PlayStation, Y on Xbox, or Q on PC. If you keep holding down your Protego button, you'll fire off the stupefy counter curse at your currently targeted enemy, which will stagger them briefly, giving you a chance to follow up with another attack. At first, this isn't very strong, but with the stupefy mastery, stunning curse, and Protego expertise and mastery talents unlocked later on, the Protego stupefy duo becomes much stronger. So, it's important to practice your Protego from the start so you can take advantage of these stronger abilities later. Even early on though, Protego can be made stronger by simply triggering it at just the right moment. Watch the orange halo closely and hit Protego just as the outer ring merges with the inner one and you'll cast a perfect Protego, a more powerful version that breaks enemy shields, deals a bit of damage, and staggers them a bit longer with your stupefy counter curse. Now, the timing on this is pretty tight, so at first I recommend you don't try to hit perfect Protegos and instead just get comfortable holding holding triangle as soon as you see the orange halo appear. So that's how to handle orange attacks. But if the halo is red, it means an unblockable attack is coming and you'll have to dodge out of the way. Fortunately, we do get invincibility frames while dodging, and if you hit circle to dodge as soon as the red halo appears, there's enough invincibility frames that you'll almost never get hit by the attack you're dodging. The exception would be if you dodge into certain enemy attacks, in which case you can still be hit. For example, when a troll charges, you'll always want to dodge to the right. If you dodge to the left, you'll often collide with their club and take damage. You can of course also dodge the orange halo attacks, but it's much better to take those as an opportunity to turn the tables with Protego and Stupefy. Now, when fighting groups of enemies, it can often feel like you're locked into the Protego animation while blocking one enemy's attack, preventing you from blocking another, but you're actually not locked in. Protego can interrupt itself, which means even if you're in the middle of blocking one enemy's attack, you can hit triangle again to block another one. You can also dodge while the Protego shield is still up, which can come in handy when things are getting a little too hectic. Dodging and movement in general is another topic I want to cover because you might be doing a little too much of it. In many games, it can be helpful to stay on the move to make it difficult for enemies to target you. But in Hogwarts Legacy, a bunch of unnecessary running and dodging can actually get you into trouble, especially when you're still learning the mechanics and timing of enemy attacks. Even once you have the swift talent, which allows you to extend your dodge by holding down the dodge button for a really cool apparition animation, you still don't want to spam it too often because the start and finish of that animation are a bit sluggish, making you susceptible to taking damage during those moments. In fact, your primary use of swift should be to reposition and gain distance from enemies, while the regular dodge should mainly be used to avoid the unblockable red attacks. So overall, instead of moving around excessively, it's best to remain calm and focus on countering the attacks you can with Protego, dodging the red halo attacks that you can't, and looking for opportunities to deal damage. Of course, sometimes we are going to take damage, so it's good to know you can carry a maximum of 25 Wiganweld healing potions and you can pop them with down on the d-pad at any time. In fact, one of the best times to heal is immediately after you take a big hit, since you'll be stunned for a moment and won't be able to do anything else anyway. You should also know that when you're at low HP, a blow will often knock you down to 1 HP, but it won't kill you, so don't count yourself out too soon. When you're in this critical health state, you also have about 3 seconds of invincibility, which makes it a bit easier to pop healing potions and get to safety. This is actually a good time to use that swift teleportation dodge to get some distance quickly, and there's actually another use for swift that I want to cover, but first, we need to talk about Ancient Magic. Ancient Magic special attacks are some of your most powerful means of dealing damage, and each time you use one, they consume a chunk of the blue Ancient Magic meter. So it's important to know how to refill this meter efficiently. The meter charges up a tiny bit each time you hit an enemy with a basic cast or slotted spell, but the way to fill it up quickly is by picking up these glowing Ancient Magic droplets that fall off enemies. These drop when you hit combo thresholds. A combo is achieved by simply chaining a bunch of hits together without getting hit yourself, or pausing for more than 8 seconds. The combo counter just above the ancient magic meter tracks these, and you'll get ancient magic droplets each time you hit a multiple of 10, so 10, 20, 30, and so on. Running through the drops will pick them up, adding some charge to your ancient magic meter, and restoring a bit of health. In fact, snagging these glowing droplets is one of the few ways to heal during combat without using potions. I wouldn't rely on them as your main healing mechanism, but it's certainly good to be aware of these drops and grab them when you can. I find the swift talent quite useful for dashing around the battlefield 
field to snag the drops before they disappear after 15 seconds. By the way guys, if you're finding these tips helpful, leaving a like on the video would be much appreciated as it really does go a long way in helping me out. The Ancient Magic special attack shouldn't be confused with the Ancient Magic throw though, which is the R1 attack you can use to whip objects like barrels and crates at enemies. Ancient Magic throws are actually very strong, especially early on, and they don't cost anything to cast, so you should absolutely use these whenever you can. I would just recommend trying to save the red explosive barrels for stronger or more annoying enemies, like the Goblin Assassins and Rangers, to eliminate them quickly. Ancient Magic throws will also break any color of enemy shield, which can be very handy as you won't be able to deal damage until a shield is down. Normally to break enemy shields, you need to hit them with a corresponding colored spell, although the unforgivable curses will also break any colored shield. Oh, and you should know that you're invincible while doing Ancient Magic special attacks and Ancient Magic throws, so you don't need to worry about taking damage in the middle of the animations. Also, keep an eye out for Ancient Magic hotspots around the map, where you can complete simple environmental puzzles to increase the maximum capacity of your Ancient Magic meter. Ancient Magic specials and throws certainly aren't the only way to deal damage though. We have plenty of cool spells that can be used in combination with each other or with other mechanics to deal huge amounts of damage, but to use any of them effectively, you first need to know how to target enemies properly. Enemies are automatically targeted for you, indicated by a glowing white outline to show that your spell will hit them when cast. By default, a setting called Camera Relative Aiming will be turned on in the gameplay options settings. This makes aiming work exactly how it sounds. Turning towards an enemy and getting them close to the center of your screen will cause them to become the active target. To switch targets, you simply pan around to a different enemy you want to focus on. On the surface, this sounds simple and good, and for many players, this is going to work just fine. But for those of you who don't like this or are interested in being able to play more dynamically, we have a couple of other targeting options. First, the game gives us a target lock-on option, so we can ensure we're staying focused on a single enemy. On PC, you trigger this by hitting the caps lock key by default. Unfortunately, the default keybinds for switching targets on PC, the left and right arrow keys, are pretty terrible. Fortunately, you can rebind them by turning on the show secondary keybinds option and changing the secondary keybinds for look right and look left. You don't have many keys available near your left hand for this, so I recommend binding those to a couple of side buttons on your mouse. Honestly though, I don't really recommend using lock on targeting on PC since you can just aim with the mouse, unless you're playing with a controller on PC, in which case you can use the same system console players have. On controller, you lock onto targets by pressing down on your right thumbstick, and switch targets by simply flicking the right thumbstick left and right. Now, if you're like me and you want a little more flexibility in how you target enemies, then you might be interested in turning the camera relative aiming setting off. With a keyboard and mouse, this will make no difference, but with a controller on any platform, you'll now be able to switch targets with your left thumbstick, which is your movement stick. This sounds strange at first, but I actually like it much better than the default mode because you don't have to swing the camera around all the time to aim at different enemies. Camera relative aiming off also has the added benefit of targeting enemies that are behind you or off screen. Plus, you can still lock onto targets, so camera relative aiming off is the most flexible mode in my opinion. Turning camera relative aiming off won't be for everyone, but it's an option you should certainly be aware of. Okay, so once you've settled on how you want to target enemies, you'll need some good ways of dealing damage. Your basic cast is pretty weak, so you mainly want to use slottable spells to deal damage, particularly the red damage ones, but you shouldn't totally ignore the basic cast. It's good for filling in the gaps while you're waiting for your spells to come off cooldown, keeping that ancient magic combo counter ticking up to trigger those ancient magic drops. You'll want to train yourself to fire off the basic cast in sets of four, as the fourth hit is much stronger than the first three, and you'll get locked into the casting animation a bit if you just spam it. Fire off four shots, and then pause to see if you need to block, dodge, or can use your more powerful spells again. Before we take a look at some essential spell combos, I want to make sure you guys know to check out the enemies card inside the collections tab of the menu, where you'll find an info card on each enemy you've encountered. Most of the enemies in Hogwarts Legacy have specific weaknesses you need to exploit, and these cards will typically tell you one or two of them for each enemy, although they don't give everything away. For example, the Dugbogs card will tell you to cast Levioso while it's winding up its tongue attack to hoist it into the air, but it doesn't tell you that following this up with Defendo will deal a huge amount of damage, often taking down the Dugbog in one shot. You can also use any of the purple force spells immediately after they do their unblockable lunge attack to flip them on their backs where they'll be vulnerable to taking massive damage from any of the red damage spells. The cards also tell us that spiders are vulnerable to fire spells like Confringo and Incendio, and the larger spiders that like to rear up for biting attacks can be 
slammed into the ground with Descendo where they'll be stuck for a moment and vulnerable to increased damage. Similarly, the spiders that burrow can be killed instantly by hitting them with Fulpendo before they get completely underground. Although the card won't tell you that Levioso also works for this. For trolls, casting Flipendo immediately after they slam their club down will flip it back in their face. This puts them in the stun state on one knee, during which they'll take over six times the normal damage from slottable spells. You can also achieve the stun state by positioning yourself near a wall and baiting them to charge into it. You'll frequently see dueling feats pop up on your screen when a combat encounter is nearby. These are often giving you the tips found in the cards, so definitely take these hints and check the cards when you're stuck on a particular enemy. Just keep in mind that there's usually also some hidden weaknesses and spell combinations you can use to great effect as well. Speaking of which, let's take a look at some of those combinations, particularly the most essential ones I think everyone should be aware of. Once you learn the Glacius spell, you'll definitely want to add it to your regular lineup. Freezing an enemy with Glacius not only immobilizes them for up to 10 seconds, but also more than doubles the damage of any of the 5 red damage spells. A common combo many players like is Glacius followed by Defendo, as Defendo has the second highest base damage of any spell in the game and it also has excellent range. Incendio has the highest damage and also has a shorter cooldown, only 10 seconds compared to Defendo's 15, but it has very limited range, so you first either have to get close to the enemy yourself or pull them close to you with Accio. Overall, you should definitely use Glacius to freeze enemies and then follow up with one of the red damage spells for a highly effective two spell combo. Just don't follow up with Expelliarmus as that's the lowest damage spell, although it has some other good uses we'll talk about in a moment. Also, keep in mind that on larger enemies like trolls, Glacius doesn't last the full 10 seconds, so you'll need to be quick if you want to follow up while they're still frozen. Another powerful combo is to use Descendo to slam enemies into the ground after getting them airborne with another spell. I prefer to do this with Accio since it also pulls small enemies close to me where I can follow up with another high damage combo. In fact, one of the strongest combos in the game changed these two together with the Glacius Incendio combo we just saw. First, pull an enemy close with Accio, then slam them down with the Sendo. Next, freeze them with Glacius and finish off the combo with Incendio. This 4 spell combo will take out pretty much any of the smaller enemies in the game, and for those that it doesn't, you can easily finish them off with one or two of the other high damage spells like Defendo, Bombarda, or Confringo. You can also create a ranged version of this combo by swapping out Accio for Levioso and Incendio with Defendo, which will let you lift the target with Levioso, slam them down with Descendo, freeze them with Glacius, and slice them with Defendo. If these 4 spell combos are a little much for you, you can stick to more simple 2 spell combos by simply casting Accio or Levioso followed by any of the high damage red spells, including Incendio, Defendo, Bombarda, and Confringo. Airborne enemies are easy to hit, and they take double damage, so these are generally pretty easy to pull off and quite effective as well. Levioso keeps enemies in the air for a full 10 seconds, which is much longer than Accio's 3, so you may want to start with Levioso when you're first experimenting with combos. As I mentioned earlier, even though Expelliarmus is the weakest of the 5 red damage spells, it can be used to disarm enemies, which when combined with the Ancient Magic Throw Expertise talent can be very strong. With this talent, you'll be able to cast Expelliarmus to disarm an enemy, and then follow up with R1 to Ancient Magic Throw their weapon back at them. Not all enemies have weapons you can do this with, but it's particularly useful against Pensieve Guardians who carry large clubs, axes and swords, and Goblin Rangers and Warriors who you can smack with their own crossbows and axes. You should also be aware that damage multipliers like Glacius can be stacked with other damage multipliers like the stun state. So, for example, if you've baited a troll into stunning itself by running into a wall, you can then also freeze it while it's down and follow up with Incendio or another high damage spell for some truly insane damage. Selecting the spell combos I like has actually become the main driver for how I organize my spell sets. In my starting tips video, I mentioned it's smart to have at least one red, purple, and yellow spell in each set to make sure you can always break a shield without swapping. I think that's totally still a legit way to do it, but we should optimize for some other factors too. My method is to put spells together in sets that I tend to use for combos. This way I can just roll through a sequence of spells really fast without switching sets. So my first set is Accio, Descendo, Glacius, and Incendio, which make up one of, if not the strongest combo in the game. It's also really nice that all four of these spells have relatively short cooldowns, lasting only 10 to 12 seconds, so I can use them again quickly. Plus I can pull off some simpler two spell combos like Accio and Descendo, or Accio and Incendio. This set also still has one of each color that I 
can use to break shields. My next set is Defendo, Bombarda, Depulso, and Arresto Momentum, which all have 15 second cooldowns. Defendo and Bombarda are mainly for dealing raw damage, as they have the second and third highest damage output. I like to use Depulso to knock enemies off ledges or shove them into walls and enemy AoE attacks like fire tornadoes. Arresto Momentum allows me to slow down the executioners who cast these cool AoE attacks, making them last longer, plus it's a great way to immobilize enemies. Notice that, with the exception of the red Bombarda being in the same spot as purple Accio, I've maintained the same color arrangement on this set as my first, which makes it easier to build muscle memory for breaking shields. My third set holds the remaining two red damage spells, Confringo and Expelliarmus, as well as Flipendo, which I like having for spiders and trolls, and Transformation, which is a lot of fun to use once you have the Transformation Master Talent that lets you turn enemies into explosive barrels you can throw. My final spell set is Flexible. This is where I'll equip the Unforgivables if I'm going to use them, and Utility spells like Lumos and the Disillusionment Charm. Another way you can consider arranging your spell sets is by grouping colors together. For example, many players like to put all the purple 4 spells in one set, the 4 high damage red spells in another, and all the yellow control spells in a third. If this sounds appealing to you, I would just suggest you consider swapping out one of the red damage spells so you can have Glacius in the same set as Incendio, Defendo, and Bombarda. This will make it easier to trigger some of the high damage Glacius combos. Talents are another very important aspect of combat, enhancing your favorite spells and unlocking new abilities. You'll gain a talent point each time you level up, and you'll be able to start spending those points after the Jackdaw main quest. And don't worry, if you level up a bunch before that quest, you'll get all the talent points retroactively. I'll be doing a dedicated video on talents, but I want to make sure you're aware of some of the essential combat ones, as it's important to remember you can't respect them once you've assigned a point. After you pick up the first five that I recommend in my essential starting tips video, linked below if you missed it, you'll also want to pick up Spell Knowledge 3 to get your last spell set, and you may also want to grab Wig and Weld Potency 1 if you feel like you're burning through healing potions really fast, though I would wait on this one until you're absolutely sure you need it. From here, I would continue prioritizing talents in the core branch. The only two I might avoid are Wig and Weld Potency 2 and Revelio Mastery, both of which I don't think are absolutely necessary. I'll also be doing a video all about gear and traits, as those are important for combat as well, but I've already got a video that gives a good overview of how these items work and shows a really helpful trick for getting the strongest traits early on, so I'll also link that down in the description if you want to check it out. For now, I'll just mention that your offense stat influences how a lot of traits work, so make sure you have your highest stat gear equipped even if it isn't the highest rarity, which will happen often until you're close to max level. Traits do stack, and they can boost your favorite spells and tools like Chinese chopping cabbages a lot, so you'll definitely want to be weaving them onto your gear once you start getting some good level 2 and 3 ones. Those plants can be very helpful in combat as well, especially the Chinese chomping cabbages and mandrakes when paired with the fertilizer and headache talents, as well as certain traits like fangs which boost the damage of the cabbages specifically, and herbology which boosts all plant damage. Stealth shouldn't be ignored either, as Petrificus Totalis is often a one-hit kill for smaller enemies. Keep in mind the invisibility potions will make you completely invisible, as opposed to the disillusionment charm that can still get you spotted. You'll want the invisibility potion potency talent to extend the potion's effect for 12 seconds if you like this playstyle, and getting the equivalent talent for the Adurus potion will make you completely invincible for 20 seconds and deflect enemy spells back at them, so they'll basically kill themselves. Finally, I want to show you a few important settings I would highly recommend you adjust to make combat easier on both PC and console. By default, the camera sensitivity is really low, meaning the camera spins very slowly, so I recommend cranking this all the way up. Camera acceleration is also way too high to start with, making turn towards enemies and targeting imprecise, so I recommend turning that down to zero or something like 0.1. The follow camera setting controls how fast the camera automatically swings around to face your player's direction, and this is another one I recommend turning all the way up. The last setting I change is camera dead zone on the accessibility tab. This controls how far you have to push the right stick on your controller to get the camera to start turning. I turn this down to zero, and even at that, there's a huge dead zone, so hopefully that's something that will be fixed in the future. Alright guys, those are all my essential combat tips for Hogwarts Legacy. If you enjoyed the video or learned something new, leaving a like would be much appreciated. And if you've got a combat tip to share, definitely leave me a comment down below. Shout out to my friends Paris, SFB, and Alan Dog over on Discord for diving into the research on combat mechanics with me. And if you want to check out that trick for getting the best traits early on, you'll want to watch this video here. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.